One of the most successful entrepreneurs in America over the past 50 years is going public with his fourth and final prediction about a scenario he calls America's nightmare winter. You've probably never heard of Bill Bonner, but in addition to owning an interest in businesses all over the globe, he also owns more than 100,000 acres with massive properties in South America, Central America, the US, plus three large properties in Europe. Bonner says we're about to enter a very strange period in America, which could result in the most difficult times we've seen in many, many years. Bonner has made three similar predictions in his 50 plus year career, and each one proved to be exactly right, although he was mocked each and every time. This is why I strongly encourage you to read about Bonner's fourth and final prediction totally free today. It's all spelled out in a free report we've put together about America's nightmare winter scenario. Get the facts for yourself. Go to americasnightmarewinter.com to get your free copy of this report. Even if he's only partially right, it will dramatically affect you and your money. So again, go to americasnightmarewinter.com for this free report. Hi, this is Daniela Cambone. Welcome back to the Daniela Cambone Show and the kickoff of our Outlook 2023 series. I have invited back to the show Max Kaiser. Howdy. The ultimate ambassador uh, of Bitcoin around the world. And what a time to have Max on because we're going to talk about the fallout from FTX and how Bitcoin has ta been taking a hit uh, from it. So how are ambassadors like uh, Max staying afloat here? Uh, you know, what are, what are they saying? What are their thoughts? Where do we go from here? How are you doing first and foremost, Maxwell? Well, hi, Daniela. Well, we're here in our home, our new home, El Salvador, and where everything is, is looking great. Uh, the economy is up sharply. They made Bitcoin legal tender, and they've, they're benefiting uh, massively as a result. GDP up 10.3%, tourism up over 100%, employment up 7%, new business up 12%, exports up 17%, internal revenue up 37%, violent crime down 95%. So, uh, you know, this is uh, an interesting decade, an interesting century where the U.S. is kind of on the way down and uh, El Salvador and the region is on the way up. And I definitely want to talk more about El Salvador later in the interview, um, but I thought I would start since I know you've been, uh, been quite vocal on uh, this uh, San Bankman Freed character and the FTX crisis. I want to get your take on it. Um, obviously, there's been a lot of comparisons uh, being made to, to Bernie Madoff, uh, but I'd like to point out that Madoff turned himself in, admitted wrongdoing. He was in the country, freed, not in the country, and not admitting to any wrongdoing yet. Right. Well, uh, the Sam Bankman freed story and FTX and FTT, which is their token, and Alameda, which is uh, kind of the hedge fund. Alameda Research yeah. that they, they created back in um, 19, uh, I'm sorry, in 2017. So um, Sam Bankman Fried came out of uh, a company called, or, uh, called Jane Capital. And it, he comes from the very shadowy world, the very shady world of high frequency trading and kind of the shadow banking system and the market making that's done kind of in the gray, a gray regulatory zone. And there's a lot of these firms that exist on the periphery. There's a lot of debate whether they're actually engaged in lawful activities or not. But that's, that's where he came from. So he came out of Jane Capital. He started Alameda Research, which is another one of these market making, high frequency trading, arbitrage, chop shops that are very fringe in terms of whether they're legal or not legal. They exist kind of on the periphery. And he was engaged in a lot of um, skullduggery over there at uh, Alameda. Then they decided to start their own exchange, FTX. And they lobbied very hard in the Bahamas where they felt that they would get very little regulatory oversight. Uh, they went ahead and they bought 10% of IEX, which is another one of these shady peripheral exchanges to give themselves regulatory legitimacy. Uh, they then floated a token called FTT, which is part of the whole 
scam token world that we've been talking about for a number of years, whether it's Ethereum or Cardano or FTT or XRP. These are just scam tokens. And he used that and listed it on other scammy exchanges to create a price. And then using that as collateral to buy assets like real estate in the Bahamas. And uh, now, as all Ponzi schemes eventually do, they run out of kind of uh, runway and they crash and burn. So uh, it is similar to Bernie Madoff in that respect. It's also similar to the, 19, uh, the 2008 financial crisis where Wall Street spun out of thin air all these derivative contracts and they created this multi-trillion dollar Ponzi scheme that blew up finally in 2008. And with the help of the Fed and central banks to bail out all the crooked bankers once again, so there's a lot of similarities to that. There's similarities you... to the SNL crisis of the, of the late 1970s, early 1980s. Uh, I should note that the SNL crisis, which is a similar crisis of using federal money to backstop a fraud, um, William K. Black, who was a regulator at the time, he put a thousand bankers in jail. And we haven't seen any, any, anybody with that kind of rigorous regulatory oversight in 40 years. There hasn't been any rigorous financial oversight in the United States and around the world. And if you're not going to oversight, if you're not going to enforce laws, you know, you're inviting these problems. So the regulators have uh, uh, really some, some answers that they need to, uh, to fill in. And um, so it's kind of a continuation, Daniela, of uh, multi-decade fr scammy fraud banking nightmare. Right. Not the first Ponzi scheme, not the last. Uh, what we what we saw with Madoff is uh, uh, regulation came in after Madoff. So do you blame the SEC partly for this fiasco that they should have stepped in with regulation before? Well, Danielle, there's lots of regulations, but uh, you have to enforce the regulations. The SEC doesn't enforce the regulations. Now, one of the uh, interesting things that have come out of all this is. Um, that you've got uh, folks like the Ethereum Foundation and lobbying groups like Andreessen Horowitz and FTX really working the regulators in Washington. Their goal was to move all regulatory oversight from the SEC to the CFTC, where they felt that they had a more captured regulator. And that was the big goal of all of their uh, regulatory malfeasance or bribery or however you want to position that and talk about it. But that was, that's been going on for a number of years. And to that end, the Silicon Valley scam coin fraudsters like Andreessen Horowitz with Solana, which is a scam, they're, they're trying to move all oversight away from the SEC to the CFTC. So the, the regulators are clearly uh, implicated, I would say it's part and parcel of a bigger picture where the, the U.S. economy is basically a kleptocracy at this point of uh, scammy bankers, scammy politicians, the scammy media outlets all colluding to defraud people. Right. And uh, the results well, are quite ugly. I'm curious to get your thoughts on the stage that Sam has been given by mainstream media and his PR spin of it, because obviously the, the guy is a master manipulator, right? I mean, when he, when he first burst out onto the scene, he was, you know, depicting himself as some sort of like whiz kid. Look, I'm an amazing business titan, Tom Brady, all these folks fell for it. And now he's appearing like, oh, I, I just didn't know. I, I guess I'm not that sophisticated enough as an investor. And I didn't see where the billions were going. So completely change of narrative here. And, and yet he's appearing on all the talk shows and whatnot. I mean, what do you make of his PR spin? Is he just a PR genius or what's he doing? Well, I think that uh, there's going to be a price to pay for Sam Bankman-Fried. So it's clear that at the core of the issue is that he stole $8 billion from FTX investors and he dumped it over at Alameda and he lost it through reckless trading. And I think that that's a pretty clear case to be made. And we've recently seen his cohort, Caroline, co-founder. She's been spotted in New York City 
It looks like she's cutting I'm a deal. I saw her in Soho. With, <laughs> yeah, in Soho. It looks like she's going to cut a deal with the New York prosecutor to turn on Sam Bankman Freed. So I, I, I think that um, he'll have his day in court and he'll end up going to prison for a very long time, as he rightfully should. Uh, the, media is, the media has grown extremely lazy in the United States. They, they gave up trying to report factually on what's happening in, around the world and in the financial markets long ago. So we can't, ex we don't, I know no one really expects or looks to the New York Times or the Washington Post to, to, to provide journalistic integrity anymore. That's, that ship sailed long ago. We know that they're just cheerleaders for the kleptocracy. They do a good job at that. They get paid well to, to, to cheerlead the kleptocrats in Washington and Wall Street. And I don't think anyone really expects anything else from them. I want to talk about uh, the outlook. You know, this is obviously part of our outlook series. Max, you're kicking it off for us here. And the damage, and I know that they should be held in two different lanes, but, you know, you can't argue the fact that Bitcoin has been thrown into the FTX disaster. People are lumping it in all into one conversation. Let's talk about the damage done to Bitcoin. No damage. No damage. No, the network has never been healthier. I, the network has never been stronger. Bitcoin, first and foremost, is a network. Network stability over price stability. And it was, Bitcoin was something that was discovered in 2008. It was dropped onto the web in 2009. It has extremely interesting properties. One of those properties is that when prices are down, it attracts a lot of critics and it attracts a lot, a, a lot of attacks which then fuel the conviction of the people who are actually investing in the network. Investments in the Bitcoin network have never been higher. That means the security has never been higher and price will take care of itself. So like Tim, um, uh, you know, uh, the VC Draper. on Tim Draper, he reiterated his $250,000 call for Bitcoin yeah, yeah. In, 20, in 2023. I concur with that entirely. Don't, don't worry, the price, will take care of itself. What we want to make sure is that the network is stable. And this Sam Bankman Freed uh, scandal uh, never touched the network. The network is still tick tock next block. There's, there's no problem. And the amount of money being poured into the network, that is into the hash rate, into the mining, into the security has never been higher. It's running at 240 quintillion hashes per second or calculations per second, which is an all time high, close to an all time high. And, and, and I think that, um, you know, Bitcoin is a wily beast. And sometimes you, I think it just likes to drop in value to, to pull out the scammers, to pull out the Mashinskys and the Kevin O'Leary's and the Mike Novogratz. You know, the scammers out there, they get exposed and then they get wiped out and then they won't have any okay. money to buy Bitcoin. Uh, so don't worry about Bitcoin, uh, you know, uh, worry about well, I'll yourself. Tell you, I'll, I'll tell you, you know, why I worry. You know, I'll, Bitcoin no, I'll tell you will why still I worry be here what my point uh, when was, all these guys are gone. <laughs> what my point was, and I want to get back to Japer. There's a lot of things I need to talk to you about. Um, but when I say people are worried, right, investors, right, who are looking at the crypto space as a whole and calling me and saying, you know, I don't know what's going to happen to Bitcoin now. There's a huge question mark surrounding the fate of, of Bitcoin. Why should I believe that Bitcoin is still going to be around? Why is this technology going to beat everything else? Why can't something come out better than Bitcoin? And I have to say, the, the experts I've had on recently, I don't feel there's been anyone who's been able to properly answer that question yet. So can you answer it today? Right. Well, I don't know anyone who's worried about it. Uh, the Bitcoin maximalists have been telling you that all these other coins are scams for years. So if you lost money with the scammers, shame on you because you got greedy. Um, so nothing I can do about that. No, um, the, people the, lost the, the money technology with Bitcoin. It's down 60% this year. It's been down before, but the network keeps rolling over and keeps ticking and investment into the network is at an all time high, Daniela. You're not listening. Investment in the network is at an all time high. OK, the, don't look at the price. The price will take care of itself. Anyone I, who's held Bitcoin for four years and you, but has, people, is in at the, the end black. Of the day, at the end of the day, people want to see numbers and they're saying, when will this be reflected in the price? Because they're just looking <laughs> at these forecasts now saying, like you know, saying these, to, these ambassadors like, have come out. 
these ambassadors <laughs> have come out with these huge forecasts and they just keep moving the goalpost, just like Draper. He's been calling for whatever, 220,000, 250,000. Now he's moving the goalpost a few months down the line. Look at the network. I, 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 sorry, I have to keep repeating myself, but the, the investment in the, in the network has never been stronger and price takes care of itself. It's like berating Warren Buffett, like, when is my Apple stock going to hit new all time highs, Warren? He'll be like, well, you know, it's uh, the fundamentals are great. We're buying more. And by the way, I'm the most successful investor in history. This is the time to buy Bitcoin because it's vastly superior. It's the best money ever known to human. It's the hardest money ever known to humans. The network's never been stronger. The use case has never been stronger. The, re the reveal that all these scam coins are, are junk, as I've been saying for years, uh, is now stronger. I, and so uh, everything is c completely as it should be. I don't, I mean, the people who can't see the difference between a Bitcoin and the scam coins like Ethereum, Cardano, XRP, et cetera, they need to do their homework. I mean, there's nothing going to, uh, they're not, it's not like you're a bank on Wall Street where every time you make a mistake, you get a bailout, uh, Daniela. We as individuals don't have that. We have to work and do research and live a, a real life. You know, we don't get the bailouts that the, uh, the Black Rocks do and the JP Morgans do. So you have to do your research. You know, you haven't looked at, you haven't done your work, do your homework and uh, your, your worries will be addressed. It's, it's, it's aesthetically, <laughs> it's beautiful. So when, for example, the president of El Salvador, Najib Bukele, says essentially that Bitcoin is based on beauty, he, he understands it. He understands that it attracts, crucially, it attracts all the energy that's going into various monetary systems purely because it's aesthetically quite beautiful. And it's like the Mona Lisa or the Sistine Chapel of Money uh, you know, the, the Mona Lisa is still the most viewed artwork in the world that attracts 20 to 30,000 visitors a day at the Louvre because it's aesthetically, it, 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 it's, it's, it's gorgeous. It's aesthetically beautiful. Bitcoin, similarly, is an aesthetically gorgeous piece of technology that makes all of the forms of money look ugly. And we know that two things. Number one, people are throwing money at it to make it more secure. It's never had more investment than it does now. And it also is attracting more energy. So these other systems, either altcoins or even fiat money, will perish due to lack of energy because they're not attracting the energy because they don't have the aesthetic that Bitcoin does. And, uh, you know, we can have this discussion all day long, but the fact of the matter is that the amount of, the, of, of, of investment going into the network is hitting new all-time highs. Those, everyone who's putting money into the network has the conviction and the belief that fiat money is doomed. They understand that no fiat money has ever survived. They've all gone to zero over 300 years. They know that all the scam coins are scams. They're all going to be classified as securities. Again, here in El Salvador, the president made these new security laws that differentiate clearly between Bitcoin and everything else. Everything else is a security per this new law. OK, so if, if, a, if you're an American and you're confused because your government and your regulators are not providing you with enough education, uh, leave, leave America, move to El when Salvador. You say record People are free of here. People are going a, into the, the, the economy network. is growing here. There's the president is working for the population. If you're living in a country like in America where the political class and the elite and the media are openly attacking you and undermining you and trying to disenfranchise you, bankrupt you and dis unemploy you, leave, get out. Take your Bitcoin and just leave. There's no reason well, to it's complain. Not, it's not There's easy only, you're only for, here yeah, once. Well, that, yeah, you, but people have, there's, you know, it's not easy for everyone to just pack up and leave. I'm sure a lot of folks would love to do that. I uh, just want to conclude on this Draper uh, because he, he looked to the gender disparity. That's kind of the, the crux of his, uh, you know, at the heart of his thesis as to why he thinks Bitcoin's going to take off. He says, my assumption is that since women control 80% of retail spending and only one in seven Bitcoin wallets are currently held by women, the dam is about to break. He goes on to say that retailers will save roughly 2% on every purchase made in Bitcoin versus uh, dollars. Once retailers realize that the 2% can double their profits, uh, Bitcoin will be uh, ubiquitous. So 
to his point, I mean, do you do you agree partly with his thesis? I'm assuming you do, but I just have a hard time seeing how this can happen in a matter of months. I mean, this this he's he's talking about a change in beliefs and and system and the way people spend money and how women shop as as to being a game changer. Yeah, in countries uh, like El Salvador, in less than a year, the entire nation understands what sound money and hard money is all about. The awareness of Bitcoin is almost 100 percent. Usage is at 20 percent. It's growing all the time and it happened pretty quickly. And the economy is up, as I said, 10.3 percent GDP and the numbers look fantastic. They're going to report right now. The estimate for El Salvador GDP is 2.8 percent. But based on what I've seen on the preliminary data, it looks like it's going to be 12 percent, Daniela. It's going to blow the doors off. It's going to be the fastest growing com country in the world. Why? Because of Bitcoin, because Bitcoin is is an amazing transformation and it can happen very, very quickly. Uh, you know, when the printing press came around, uh, things happen quickly. When the people, you know, uh, Thomas Edison was hacking away, trying to figure out how to make a light bulb work for years, tried thousands of different materials for the filament, then suddenly figured it out. And within two years, uh, you know, we went from gas lights to electric lights. So when things change like this, they happen very, very quickly. If you're in a country like the United States, which is uh, uh, basically gets is an entitled, has an entitlement uh, fixation that they alone should be entitled to the world's riches and that everyone else in the world should beg and scrimp at the feet of America. Well, you're going to have a problem because the axis of power and the pendulum of power is swinging away from the dollar and the fiat money world. It's, it's a new century. It's a new world, Daniela. So again, if you're unhappy in the United States, I suggest you move and move now before prices here start getting out of hand and you won't be able to afford anything. Right now you can. I, food is cheap. I housing was, is cheap. Uh, I, I watched your full interview with Tucker Carlson and learned that uh, your family, uh, you know, dates, it was been in the U.S. for 300 years. So you are you know, or, or, or a real American, a proud American from what I gauged uh, from that interview. And I thought that was interesting. Yeah, I, the Amer but America is an idea. And I have America, the idea of America in my heart. And I am uh, in here, you'll find Salvadorans who are express the ideals of America more than you will in America. In America, the it's become a free money kind of proto communist dictatorship and a Politburo at the Federal Open Market Committee and a scandalous kleptocracy. It makes the Soviet Union look good by comparison over there in the United States, I must say. So if you want to talk to people who love freedom, liberty, uh, property and pursuit of happiness, they're in El Salvador. It's happening here uh, because the idea found a place to grow here in the jungle in Central America. So you, uh, the, you left the asphalt like you, you in the United sold... States killed that idea. So, uh, yeah, I've been in, yeah. in the United States You're for 300 years, but now I'm in the new, new world, El Salvador. So you sold your house in the States. You're gone. You're out. I have I have several houses all over the world, Daniela, uh, but my I live here and I um, do my work here and I live here and I, I identify as a Salvadoran. I'm, I'm transitioning, Daniela. I'm transitioning. I, I identify as a Salvadoran and uh, that's where I'm at. And um, it's gorgeous. It's 82 degrees, uh, 35 <laughs> degree humidity. I'm looking at a volcano right now in the distance. And uh, the city of San Salvador is booming. Uh, restaurants are opening up. Hotels are going up. The people are happy. The, 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 the president got, cut violent crime down by 95 percent. That's like giving the population of 7 million people a $6 billion gift because $6 billion in this $28 billion economy was being extorted every year by the gangs. Max Kaiser, Max Kaiser is transitioning. Yes, I'm <laughs> transitioning to uh, Salvadoran. Exactly. Um, okay. Uh, I want and to the way to do thoughts. it is it's about pupusas. Make pupusa, not war. That's my t-shirt today, Daniela. Make Make pupusas, not war. You see, if you eat enough pupusas, you become Salvadoran or, or Siva, as they say. And uh, that's all you need to transition to become a full, full blooded and, and have uh, liberty and freedom in your heart and in your soul. And everything that America says it's for, but no longer is for, you'll find here in El Salvador.
How is your Spanish coming along? Uh, really, really poorly, um, <laughs> but I'm getting better at mime. Uh, you know, like okay. I can mime things better. <laughs> Um, okay, want to get your thoughts now on uh, c concerns now uh, surrounding Tether loans. Uh, could the next fiasco be Tether? No. No? No. That's it. Well, it, it's... Uh, it, it's just no. <laughs> it's the first, it's, you know, it first, it's, it's a bit of a... It, the, the stable coin market is outside, really, of Bitcoin and... The, can I say shitcoin on the show? I don't want to offend anybody. Yes, go ahead. No, right? no there's one's Bitcoin, offended. And then there's Mike Novogratz and a bunch of shitcoins, right? So, and then there's stable coins, which is kind of, uh, it's a hybrid, it's a product. It's like a money market fund. It's a way to get on and off of various exchanges. It was born during an era when a lot of exchanges had different prices for Bitcoin and you needed to go from one exchange to another. So this tether was invented and, um, is it, it has it's backed by uh, U.S. dollars and it's backed one one for one by U.S. dollars and it's like a money market fund and uh, unlike let's say Circle which is another one a stable coin but they actually um, pay people to use Circle and and as such they are on the verge of bankruptcy whereas that Tether doesn't pay anyone to use Tether. Uh, there's a big difference there. So I'd say Circle is about to go bankrupt. Circle is the one you need to work. It's U USDC. That's the one to look out for. Circle. They're in trouble. They're the next FTX. They're about to go bankrupt. That's a big pile of shit is Circle. I want to uh, bring up that Tucker Carlson interview. Like I said, I watched it. I, I enjoyed it. Um, but one thing I was thinking, and I want to share this with you, is when you spoke gold, and you were saying how, you know, gold can be confiscated. You were educating Tucker on this. And I'm thinking, Max, you don't really believe that in today's day and age. I'm thinking you don't believe it, that gold would be confiscated. And first of all, gold wasn't confiscated, uh, you know, under Roosevelt. People had, to work, he would, people had to turn in their gold. It was made a legal turn. But it's not like people were showing up at your door, knocking on the door, asking for the gold. But I'm thinking you don't really in your heart of hearts believe that in today's day and age, people's physical gold would be confiscated. Do you really believe that statement? Well, first of all, the gold was confiscated um, and did, people did go to people's doors looking for gold. And some of the gold from that era showed up recently as, as recently as last year and that was had to be given back to the government. Uh, you know, the Fort Knox was built to hold all the gold that was confiscated. That 22,000 tons or whatever it was at that point was the, was the gold that the U.S. government confiscated from Americans. So it's, it's incorrect to say that it wasn't confiscated. Uh, number two, um, we just saw, for example, in Canada, uh, banks seizing people's property uh, in the banking system. So government seizing property is alive and well here in the 21st century. Uh, we've seen um, the U.S. government seize billions of dollars of foreign reserves recently, in the case of Russia. So again, they, the U.S. dollar in the banking system has been weaponized. As you know, Daniela, when you put money into the bank, you no longer own that money. It's not your money held by mm -hmm. the bank. You become a creditor to the bank. It's their money. In the case of a liquidation, your deposits are used to pay the debts of the bank. So you, any money you keep in the bank is not safe. Gold, getting back to gold for a second. So it, it does get confiscated and it is compared to Bitcoin, extraordinarily easy to confiscate gold. Uh, it's not portable. If I wanted to move um, 10 million, 100 million or a billion dollars worth of gold, it's extremely difficult to move it from point A to point B. Whereas with Bitcoin, I can walk naked through the airport with my seed phrase, go anywhere in the world, and there's a billion dollars worth of Bitcoin. So there's no portability problem whatsoever uh, with Bitcoin. With gold, you have verification problem. All gold that's transacted if it's really serious transaction, you need a third party to verify that it's actual gold. There's a serial number. There's a bar number. It's not tungsten wrapped in gold. So that's that's time consuming. That's expensive, and it's it's not fail safe. 
With Bitcoin, the transaction is the verification. No third-party verification is needed. The, the transaction is the verification. It's all transparent on the ledger and for anyone to see. So again, that's vastly superior to gold. Um, it's more divisible than gold, down to 100 million places. Uh, it's just to go to right down the list. It's superior to gold uh, in every way. So um, I, that's, that's, the, that's, I that's, this up. that's the fact, Jack. I bring this up. And we're going to uh, we're going to fact check that history because I disagree with you on how the on the confiscation went down. But I bring this up and I know I brought it up in the past interview, but those were your roots were gold and silver. I mean, you love silver so much. There was a max silver coin crash banksters buy silver. What happened in your investment philosophy that you were like, yeah, you know what? I'm out. I'm out of silver. I'm out of gold. Right. Well, that campaign was in 2011. I started buying Bitcoin in 2011. So what happened was Bitcoin. Right, but you over believed the, over in the, it over so the, much. Over the so subsequent trying, few years. It's a years. fair question. I'm trying to understand. Yeah, well, uh, uh, over what the, made, over the, the, the subsequent, subsequent years, years as, uh, as Bitcoin started to make its way into the economy, it, be, and it, it, it showed superior attributes to, to, to gold and silver, um, it, it I walked away from gold and silver because I something came along that was better, and it and um, so I, what's the question really? I mean that that seems like. So are you like completely? A, the question is the question is last time last year when I spoke because we always do this outlook. People love our outlooks. Last year at this time you were saying you were you were you were you know phasing out completely out of gold and silver. You had started that process. Are you completely out now, or do you still own gold and silver? I have one gold ounce. It's a, it's a Canadian maple leaf, and I carry it around with me to show people and talk about how incredibly stupid it is to own gold. That's it, just one ounce. But it's a Canadian maple leaf, so that speaks to my heart. Just one ounce. Um, okay. That's it, I'm, I'm down from- Like I said, uh, it's our outlook. <laughs> it's our outlook, and unfortunately, no, at one time, last year, you know, I wrote Daniel, down my forecast. Daniela, at one time, I did own over a ton, an, an actual ton of silver, but I know. I know that's why I bring silver. it up, and I think <laughs> and I know, I know, I know you owned a ton of silver. That's why I'm like, how does one go from believing in an asset so much and then completely because something better having... came along? The, the, the whole world of investing. Well, is that to was be, my first to point agile. to you. How do you know? You have, Absolutely, well, you have to, have, I don't, you have to look at the new information, but that and you was have my to be opening question. To change your outlook. You can't be. That was you my know, opening um, question to you. Absolutely. Down but how to do the you bottom, know? like let's <laughs> say, uh, let's say, like a Mike Novogratz, for example, who held Luna down to the bottom. You can't be dumb like that. Mm. But that's why I asked my, my intro question. How do you know that something better than Bitcoin won't come around? You have to have an open mind to that. I see, because I see you know, two things. Uh, aesthetically, it's, it's perfection and it's attracting all this investment at a rate that uh, nothing else is coming close. It's also attracting all the energy in the world in a way that nothing is, is coming close. And it does what it does to perfection. It's like... The wheel, you know, once the basic architecture of the wheel was figured out, and the wheel wasn't universally accepted, but a lot of people figured out, you know, when the wheel did come along that, you know, this is probably the absolute best design to put on a cart to move stuff around the wheel. And uh, the, that design has not changed. It's still a 360 degree circumference. It's called the wheel. And it, um, is what we still live with today. Bitcoin, similarly, it's the finally, after a million years of trying to look for perfect money, we as humans found it in 2009, it's called Bitcoin. And, and, and we see in a country like El Salvador that it's had an immediate, dramatic, positive impact and that's spreading to the region, to Guatemala and other countries in Central America, it's spreading to Mexico, it's, and it's popping up all over the world, we will soon be on a global Bitcoin standard and the price will be considerably higher where it is today and everyone will be kicking themselves that they didn't buy it when it was cheap down here in the teens. You know, that's always the story. They'll say, oh, it's, it's going down, I'm afraid to buy it. Oh, it's too expensive, I missed the boat. And most people never make intelligent or wise investment decisions because they're <laughs> driven by greed and fear. 
And instead of just doing the homework, do the work, do the research, understand what it is that we're talking about, the, the more work you do, the, the higher your conviction is. I've never met a single person who spent more than, let's say, two or three hours studying Bitcoin who did, didn't become a Bitcoin believer. Um, in your case, I would say that because you're on a network that favors a competing commodity, which is gold, you know, there's absolutely a bit of not. a, um, you know, maybe a absolutely conflict there. Not. But a absolutely everyone not. else who's absolutely without not. any conflict whatsoever, who just looks <laughs> at this thing purely uh, on as a rational, empirical basis within the several hours, they will understand what Bitcoin's all about. And they don't worry anymore. They simply see uh, the lower prices as a a good uh, entry point, and they understand that sometimes when the price is cheap, it actually attracts people to attack Bitcoin, which then ends up increasing the conviction we're of those just, people who are having, investing in the having, network, having, who then increase the security, and then the price goes a conversation. up. We are having a conversation. It's my, my job to, to bring up you know, questions that the folks want to hear. Um, but there is no bias, especially on my part. I own both uh, gold and Bitcoin. I've been quite transparent about that. Um, so I'm, you know, interested to get your your take on on things as they are right now. And people love this outlook with you, Max, because they love uh, hearing where you think Bitcoin will be headed in 2023. Um, I know last year you were sticking to your 220,000 call. Uh, I'm I'm pretty sure that's what you're going to stick to in 2023. Am I wrong? I, you know who really loves what I've been saying are the people who followed me and bought Bitcoin under ten dollars. Those people really love me, I can tell you. I get emails every day. I put my kids through college. I bought a new house. I did this, I did that. Um, so I'm, the love is just like a tsunami of love over here. Uh, and I think that for all those folks out there who want to put the research and do the work, uh, they, they'll see that the current price is an actual, excellent entry point for unconfiscatable, uncensorable property that's portable. And obviously is going to do better than any fiat money out there and is superior to gold, in my opinion. And of course, other people have their different opinion. Where are the prices going right now? It's the price is going higher. Uh, like I said earlier, I look at the strength of the network is really the number I look at. I don't look at the price so much. I look at how how the network is doing and how the hash rate is doing and are people committing capital to the network. And that's at all time highs. So for me, Bitcoin's at an all time high today. That's what, the price. Is, it, it's a lagging indicator. The price is a lagging indicator of Bitcoin. If you look at the way that the commitments on the on the investing on the network side, it's at all time highs and price catches up as it always does. And anyone who's held it for four years is in the black. They're making money. So if you can't hold your shit for four years, you shouldn't be an investor. Go to Las Vegas, play the uh, slot machines and the roulette wheel and have a couple of cocktails and go home. You're not an investor. If you can't have a, at least a four year horizon, you're not an investor. You're a gambler. You're a degenerate gambler, undoubtedly. And you should just go to the g casinos and blow your cash and have a few cocktails and maybe get laid. But don't call yourself an investor if, you're t if your time horizon is less than four years because you're not. So hate to be okay, say, could, break, hate to be harsh. Could, you know, I worked on Wall Street for many years, no, and I've had I get to give it, this speech about... to many, many people who don't understand the difference between gambling and investing. Okay, people and talk, care read, about read anything price. by Peter Lynch. He'll say, you know, seven years minimum before anything pays off. Warren so, Buffett, what's I, I your just... favorite holding period? Forever, right? So <laughs> if you're looking at a, oh, I'm I'm up, I'm down, you know, in the last two weeks, like. You need to go to the casino. You're not an investor. Go away. Leave me alone. Beat it. Does are you would so we don't have to wait until 2024 uh, to see massive moves. You're saying it could still happen in 2023. Absolutely, sure. It, 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 the the direction. The, I mean, when you're talking about investments, you have to get a couple of things right. Number one, without doubt, the thing you need to get right more than anything else is the direction. Okay. The direction for Bitcoin for 13 years has been up and it'll be up for the next 20, 30, 40, 50 years. So that's number one, that's solved. The direction is up. Then it's about asset allocation and how you want to scale into it. Do you, 
and that's up to everyone's individual uh, style. You know, I can't comment on that because different people have different ways of, of doing it. I think in the case of fiat money, you're guaranteed to lose purchasing power, mathematically guaranteed to lose purchasing power with the dollar and all fiat money. With Bitcoin, you're mathematically guaranteed to increase purchasing power. It's like two plus two equals four. You're going to have mathematically guaranteed to increase purchasing power. With gold, okay, um, it's going to hang in there against inflation. Every time we talk, Daniela, gold's around seventeen, eighteen. $100 an ounce. That's been doing this for 10 years now. Um, maybe it'll break out this time. Uh, but I have a feeling that if we talk again in six months to a year, gold will still be at $1,800 an ounce. And oh. everyone will be talking about it's about to break out. It's about to break out. It, it really, by definition, can't break out. Uh, really, uh, it's too big. It's too concentrated. And um, it does, it's not like uh, so it's not like it, you know, I just I mean, it can't really outpace inflation dramatically. It's got to stay within a few percentage points of what the inflation number is. So that's gold. I mean, it's okay. great store of value over a hundred years and a thousand years. Uh, and but if you want to pay for the storage, the transportation, the verification, and not have something that's completely immobile, can't move it around, and uh, it can be seized. If that's okay with you, then gold's okay. If you want something that has a breakout potential that's far superior to gold, it's portable, um, it's unconfiscatable, it's immutable, it's uncensorable, it has everything but gold has, but a thousand times better than Bitcoin's for you. He believes in Bitcoin more than ever, folks. You heard it here first. Why wouldn't I? Or not first. Why um, wouldn't I? Okay. The, the, Wait, the network's been running let's, let's flawlessly just, for 13 just, years. Okay. It's never let's missed put a the moment. Gold, put, the gold, put the gold of Bitcoin over there for a second. Because another big part of the outlook, uh, you've come on saying, making a forecast that a, a central bank would fail. You had yeah. pointed, or you were thinking it could be the ECB last year at this time. And everyone's like, really? The European Central Bank is going to collapse in 2022? Obviously, it has not. Uh, your thoughts on your favorite folks of all time, central bankers. Do you still right, well, think we the, could the, see the, one fail? Could it still be the ECB? The, the, the Lebanese central bank uh, yes. failed. Uh, the Ukrainian right. central bank looks like it's about to fail. Credit Suisse and Deutsche Bank, which are huge counterparties to the ECB, they look like they're about to fail. And um, the... European zone is introducing draconian uh, financial uh, measures that we also see in the UK where they're rationing energy in the UK. They're rationing food in the UK. So that's like a soft failure. They haven't formally declared bankruptcy at the Bank of England and the ECB, but they have structurally and effectively gone bankrupt. Uh, they're simply pretending like they're not bankrupt. The underlying member banks are all completely insolvent and going bankrupt. They have only one play in the playbook, and that's to print money. So inflation is a huge problem. Um, and that whether the, the, the day that they formally announce bankruptcy, it'll be already too late and everyone will have figured it out already. And um, so I stick to my, my guns on this one. Their central banks are deteriorating uh, rapidly because of all this incredible debt. You know, people are talking about right now in the U.S., the the debt when you add in both Social Security and Medicaid uh, and the other liabilities is closer to 66 trillion, not the, not the 30 trillion that they say that they have in debt. It's uh, much greater. Uh, there's no way to address that debt. The interest on the debt will soon be a bigger line item on the books than the military, and the military is already taking $1.5 trillion away from taxpayers. So the Federal Reserve Bank is structurally insolvent. Um, it's leveraged incredibly much. The Fed is leveraged higher than Enron ever was. And uh, so we can pretend that they're not structurally insolvent and bankrupt if we want to. But uh, I think that's a loser's game. I think you have to understand that the central money, uh, the central banks and the fiat money game is over, uh, particularly since the war that started in February, where the producers of commodities, like the biggest producer of commodity in the world, is saying, you know what, we're going to price commodities now based on true supply and demand, not based on financialization or Wall Street. So that's going to put a lot of pressure on these over leveraged banks. So it's better to be a little early than a one day too late, Daniela.
I think Jim um, Rogers, Jim Rogers, I think coined that <laughs> phrase, you know, back in 1950. I just, want, <laughs> I just want to be clear. When the gold experts come on, I grill them just as much as why gold is not moving, just to be fair. Um, so well, I really touched the source I, I spot wanna, there, Daniela. You seem well, defensive suddenly. Not. I mean, I hope it's I hope no. I didn't touch a nerve. No, I think I no, I think I touched the nerve for you. That's why I bring it up. So well, it sounds like sex. Clear. <laughs> I don't know what's on your mind, but hey, <laughs> I want to say you brought it up. Thank you for your time. Why are we like an old married couple? Why are we shouting? Why am I shouting? I have laryngitis. Okay. Um, I want to say thank you for coming on. I didn't even get to ask you about the BRICS versus the U.S. and all that good stuff. So come on another time and we'll talk that. Um, give my regards to Stacey and happy holidays. What are you getting Danielle, me for Christmas? it's always a pleasure. You know, we've been doing this for a long time. And we have the utmost respect Long for time. each other. Thanks Happy again. Happy holidays, seasons, greetings. <laughs> Happy Christmas. Um, thank you. And to your producers over there just, who, who do all the hard work. Thank you so much for everything they that do. you do. They do. Excellent. I work with the best team. Uh, Lindsay, amen to particularly, that. she seems like she's a no-nonsense producer who just delivers the goods every time flawlessly. Lindsay is the best. Lindsay is the best. We are very lucky. Uh, and she's never allowed to go anywhere else. She went on vacation for two weeks. Never again, Lindsay. Okay. Max, thank you so much. Stacey, I know you're watching. Hello. And to all of you, thank you for watching another great Outlook series with Max Kaiser. If you want to stay on top of all these great interviews, don't forget to sign up at DanielaCambone.com. That's it for me. We'll be back. Opinions expressed on this program are solely those of the contributor and do not necessarily reflect the opinions of Stansbury Research, its parent company, or affiliates.